going to get rid of the whole thing and have one single rate, 14.5% for everybody, business and for uh, corporate, in, corporate income and personal income. But we also get rid of the payroll tax, so the working class would get a tax break as well. So I think a flat tax, eliminating the tax code, getting rid of all the loopholes is the way to go, and it's the way we get America going again. Governor Walker, I want to go to yeah. you. Uh, Dr. Carson wants to raise the federal minimum wage. You have called it a lame idea. Why is raising the federal minimum wage lame? I said the best way to help people see their wages go up is to get them the education, the skills they need to take on careers that pay far more than minimum wage. And it's why we talk about it. it's all about jobs. You want to help people actually get jobs. It's why on that last question we were trying to jump in on in taxes. To me, it's not just about taxes, cutting taxes. I've done as much as anybody. I've cut income taxes. I've cut property taxes. In fact, property taxes are lower today in my state than they were before we took office. The real issue is about jobs. Ronald Reagan, our plan is based on the Ronald Reagan tax cuts of 1986. That brought about one of the longest sustained periods of economic growth in American history. All the things we should be talking about tonight are about how do we create jobs, helping people get the skills and the education and qualifications they need to succeed. That's the way you help people create jobs. It's part of our larger plan to reform the tax code, to cut taxes, uh, to put, uh, uh, put in place an education system that gives people the skills and education that they need, to put in place an all the above energy policy. But you start on day one with repealing Obamacare. I'm the only one on the stage who's actually got a plan, you introduced an actual plan to repeal Obamacare on day one. I'll send a bill up to Congress and to make sure they actually enact it. Thank I'm you, Governor. Sign, I'm going to sign an order that makes the Congress live by the same rules as everybody else. Thank you, Governor. That will ensure they repeal Dr. Obamacare. Carson, Governor Walker didn't really answer the question, but I'll let you respond. He called yeah. raising the federal minimum wage lame. What do you think of that? Well, first of all, let me say what I actually said about raising the minimum wage. Uh, I was asked, should it be raised? I said, probably or possibly. But what I added, which I think is the most important thing, is I said we need to get both sides of this issue to sit down and talk about it, negotiate a reasonable minimum wage, and index that so that we never have to have this conversation again in the history of America. I think we also have to have two minimum wages, a starter and a sustaining. Because how are young people ever going to get a job if you have such a high minimum wage that it, it, it makes it impractical to hire them? Thank you, but Dr. Jake, Carson. Jake, I want to Jake, now turn Jake, to Hugh. Uh, I want Jake, to turn just to Hugh. that issue, because you Go said ahead. I did answer, and I did. I said, to me, I think the real focus shouldn't be, you know, Hillary Clinton talks about the minimum wage. That's her answer to grow the economy. The answer is to get people the skills and the education so they make far more than minimum wage. I don't want to argue about how low things are going to be. I want to talk about how do we lift everyone up in America. That's what Reagan talked about. It wasn't how bad things were. It was how to make it better for everyone. That's what we've done in Wisconsin. That's exactly what we do as Let president. me bring in our partner from Salem Radio Network, Hugh Hewitt. I'd like to talk about winning because I think all of you are more qualified than former Secretary of State Clinton, and as were the people in the first debate. But there are different styles. And uh, Carly Fiorina, Governor Kasich, you are conveniently located next to each other and you have different styles. Governor Kasich, you've been on my show a lot. You refuse to attack Hillary Clinton. You just don't want to go there. You want to do the up with people, go Ohio campaign. And I like that. Carly Fiorina, I don't have to bring up the Secretary of State. <laughs> you bring her up, Sue Esponte. Which one of you is wrong, Governor Kasich? Well, look, I'm. People still have to get to know me, so I want to spend my time talking about my experience reforming welfare, balancing budgets, cutting taxes, providing economic growth when I was in Washington, turning Ohio around, $8 billion in the hole, $2 billion surplus, up over 300,000 jobs, big tax cuts, uh, strengthening our credit. All those things matter. But, you know, I, I, as a young man, uh, in my first election in 1978, I defeated an incumbent Democrat. I defeated an incumbent Democrat in 1982, running on the Reagan program. I was the only Republican in America to defeat an incumbent Democrat that year. And then when I uh, won for election to governor, I was the first Republican to defeat an incumbent in 36 years, and the first person to have never run statewide, out of politics for 10 years, to beat an incumbent. That hadn't happened for 96 years. So we'll get to the point where we'll talk about Hillary Clinton or whoever the nominee is record. But right now, I want to give people a sense of hope, a sense of purpose, a sense of unity, a sense that we can do it. So, um, you Governor. know, you at the end of the day, I'm going to continue to talk about my record because there's – do you ever notice when people run for office, they run for president, they make a lot of promises, they don't keep them. Thank I don't you, intend Governor. to do that, and I'm going to be out there pushing and I'll – don't worry about me and Hillary. That'll all work out. And I'm from Ohio. She will not beat me there. I can promise you that. Carly Fiorina, your style. 
You see, Governor Christie, people spend a lot of time talking about their track records, and Mr. Trump and I have every right to do the same. And Mrs. Clinton is going to have to defend her track record, her track record of lying about Benghazi, of lying about her emails, about lying about her servers. She does not have a track record of accomplishment. Like Mrs. Clinton, I too have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles around the globe. But unlike Mrs. Clinton, I know that flying is an activity. It is not an accomplishment. <laughs> Mrs. Clinton, if you want to stump a Democrat, ask them to name an accomplishment of Mrs. Clinton. Thank you, Ms. Fiorina. Governor Christie, your name was mentioned. I want to give you a chance to respond. Listen, you know, Hugh, it's, a, it's an important point. And the question is, who's going to prosecute Hillary Clinton? The Obama White House seems to have no interest. The Justice Department seems to have no interest. I think it's time to put a former federal prosecutor on the same stage with Hillary Clinton, and I will prosecute her during those debates on that stage for the record that we're talking about here. The fact that she had a private email server in her basement using national security secrets running through it could have been hacked by the Russians, the Chinese, or two 18-year-olds on a toot wanting to have some fun. No one's answering that question from the Hillary Clinton clamp. You know you, why? Because she knows she's wrong and she cannot look in the mirror at herself and she cannot tell the American people the truth. Thank you, Governor Christie. There is a whole lot more coming up ahead. A world of trouble. The challenges that one of these candidates may face in the Oval Office and how he or she will handle it. Stay with us. Welcome back to CNN's Republican presidential debate. Let's turn to some issues now in foreign policy. Mr. Trump, Senator Rubio said it was, quote, very concerning to him that in a recent interview you didn't seem to know the details about some of the enemies the U.S. faces. Rubio said, if you don't know the answers to those questions, you will not be able to serve as commander-in-chief. Please respond to Senator Rubio. Well, I heard you, you, it, a nice man. He apologized because he actually said that we had a misunderstanding, and he said today that Donald Trump is maybe the best interview there is anywhere that he's ever done. Now, unless he was just saying that on CNN to be nice, but he did say that. Oh, <laughs> well, you're the best interview in America. And we had a legitimate misunderstanding in terms of his pronunciation of a word, but... Uh, I would say just, <laughs> well, I think it was. And he actually said that. Did you say that? And so so radio together. makes an interesting thing. Okay, so uh, I will say this, though. Uh, you was giving me name after name, Arab name, Arab name, and there are few people anywhere, anywhere that would have known those names. I think he was reading them off a sheet. And frankly, I will have, and I told him, I will have the finest team that anybody's put together, and we will solve a lot of problems. You know, right now, they know a lot, and look at what's happening. The world is blowing up around us. We will have great teams and great people. Senator I hope Rubio? that answers yeah. your question. I mean, you are, on, you are in the Senate, but I hope yeah. that answers your question. Well, it does, but then it's the following way. This is an important question. I think if you're running for president, these are important issues, because look around the world today. There is a lunatic in North Korea with dozens of nuclear weapons and a long-range rocket that can already hit the very place in which we stand tonight. The Chinese are rapidly expanding their military. They hack into our computers. They're building artificial islands in the South China Sea, the most important shipping lane in the world. A gangster in Moscow is not just threatening Europe. He's threatening to destroy and divide NATO. You have radical jihadists in dozens of countries across multiple continents, and they even recruit Americans using social media to, to try to attack us here at home. And now we've got this horrible deal with Iran where a radical Shia cleric with an apocalyptic vision of the future, is also guaranteed to one day possess nuclear weapons and also a long-range rocket that can hit the United States. These are extraordinarily dangerous times that we live in. And the next president of the United States better be someone that understands these issues and has good judge judgment about them. Because the number one issue that a president will ever confront and the most important obligation that the federal government has is to keep this nation safe. And today, we are not doing that. We are eviscerating our military, and we have a president that is more respectful to the Ayatollah in Iran than he is to the Prime Minister of Israel. Mr. Trump, <laughs> Senator Rubio seemed to be suggesting that you don't know information. No, I don't that think he's suggesting that at all. I mean, are I you, just Senator Rubio? Are I don't think he's well, suggesting that. Well, that's why we have that. a debate. I think that we should have a deeper debate about these issues, because there is no more important decision that a president will make. But are you saying that you have in, uh, the knowledge to be the president that Mr. Trump does well, not that's have? What this, well, you should ask him questions in detail about the foreign policy issues our president will confront, because you better be able to lead our country on the first day. 
Not six months from now, not a year from now, on the first day in office, our president could very well confront a national security crisis. You can't predict it. Sometimes you cannot control it. And it is the most, the federal government does all kinds of things it's not supposed to be doing. It regulates bathrooms. It regulates schools that belong to, to, to local communities. But the one thing that the federal government must do, the one thing that only the federal government can do is keep us safe. And a president better be up to date on those issues on his first day in office, or on her first day in office. <laughs> Mr. Trump. Well, you have to understand, I am not sitting in the United States Senate with, by the way, the worst voting record there is today, uh, number one. I am not sitting in the United States Senate. I'm a businessman doing business me, I transactions. Okay. I am doing business transactions. I will know more about this, and as you said, that was very acceptable. And when you listened to that whole interview, it was a great interview. You said it. I didn't. Yeah. Well, well he, now he, I did. No, but had, I will, listen, just no, one second. Well, but he addressed just one me. second. I never get addressed I will so know, when I do. I'm going to jump in. I will right. know more about the problems of this world by the time I sit. And you look at what's going on in this world right now by people that supposedly know this world is a mess. Senator Rubio, he didn't yeah, vote did. your absentee me, record in the I'm Senate. I'm proud to serve in the United States Senate. You know, when I ran five years ago, the entire leadership of my party in Washington lined up against me. But I'm glad I won, and I'm glad that I ran, because this country's headed in the wrong direction. And if we keep electing the same people, nothing is going to change. And you're right, I have missed some votes, and I'll tell you why, Mr. Trump. Because in my years in the Senate, I figured out very quickly that the political establishment in Washington, D.C., in both political parties, is completely out of touch with the lives of our people. You have millions of people in this country living paycheck to paycheck, and nothing's being done about it. We are about to leave our children with $18 trillion in, in, in debt, and they're about to raise the debt limit again. We have a world that grows increasingly dangerous, and we are eviscerating our military spending and signing deals with Iran. And these, if this thing continues, we are going to be the first Americans to leave our children worse off than ourselves. That's why I'm missing votes, because I am leaving the Senate, I'm not running for re-election, and I'm running for president, because I know this, unless we have the right president, we cannot make America fulfill its potential. But with the right person in office, the 21st century can be the greatest era that our nation has ever known. Thank you, Senator Rubio. I want to turn now to Hugh Hewitt. Thank you, Jake. I've done a lot of great interviews with all of you, but Governor Bush, I talked to you in February about the biggest elephant in a room full of elephants, which is your last name. And you told me that you would not be burdened either by your brother or your father's legacy in the Middle East. And then a week later, you rolled out your list of foreign policy advisors, and it was a lot of the band getting back together again. So on behalf of the military that is watching, yeah. okay, the active duty military that are at the end of the spear, what kind of a commander-in-chief is Jeb Bush going to be, and who are the advisors that are new to your team? Well, first of all, Hugh, if you're looking at Republican advisors, you have to go to the last two administrations that happen to be 41 and 43. So just by definition, if you're – and many of the people here that are seeking advice from the foreign policy experts in the Republican side, they, they served in my dad's administration, my brother's administration. Of course that's the case. But I'm my own man. I'm going to create a strategy that's based on – the simple fact that the United States needs to lead the world. The first thing that we need to do is to stop the craziness of the sequester, rebuild our military so that, our, so that we don't deploy people over and over again without the necessary equipment to keep them safe, to send a signal to the world that we're serious. If we're going to lead the world, then we need to have the strongest military possible. We need to rebuild our counterintelligence and intelligence capabilities. We need to focus on the fact that the next president is going to start in 2017, not in 1990, you know, 30 years ago, or when my brother started. The world is dramatically different. And I believe that we need to restore America's presence and leadership in the world. Name a country where our relationship is better today than it was the, the day that Barack Obama got elected president. Under Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, we have seen a weakness that now creates huge problems for the next president of the United States. So I'll have a team that will be, that will be following the doctrine that I set up, and it'll be peace through strength. We're sitting here in this library, which is a wonderful place to talk about this, because that's exactly what happened in the 1980s, and the world was a lot safer because of the leadership of Ronald Mr. Reagan Mr. and Mr. my Trump. I, 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 I want to ask you a question, though. You've promised us great leaders, and I believe that, but Jeb Bush has laid out 20 different people that have experience around the world. There are 190 countries. You can't run the world by yourself. When are we going to get some names? on your military and your foreign Very policy soon, advisors. And I'm meeting with people that are terrific people, but I have to say something because it's about judgment. I am the only person on this dais, the only person that fought very, very hard against us, and I wasn't a sitting politician, going into Iraq. Because I said going into Iraq, that was in 2003, you can check it out, 
check out, I'll give you 25 different stories. In fact, a delegation was sent to my office